Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we have the privilege to have Daniel Buckner with us, who's one of the leading decentralized digital identity experts. He's the decentralized identity lead at Microsoft um, and also a big Bitcoin fan as myself. And um, he will be telling us today about Iron, which is a layer two network um, for identity on top of Bitcoin. And um, I really look forward to this presentation because um, as we can see in the identity space um, or in the decentralized identity space, there's a very rich and dynamic um, action going on in all from very, very many initiatives. And this is one of those that I'm really looking forward to learn more about. Just gonna have a quick look at the second slide to share with everyone um, what we're trying to do here at um, SSI Meetup. So what we're trying to do is to empower global SSI communities and that can mean companies, individuals, groups, um, whoever's interested in SSI and, and, and wants to do something about this. And to do this, um, um, we're sharing all the content we're creating here with our guests um, with the Creative Commons by Share Like License, which basically means you can use this um, in whatever way you want. You just need to give credit back um, to the author, in this case, Daniel, um, and, and to SSI Meetup, um, where you use this. And you, um, so far, I think you have um, 28 presentations that you can use and you can watch the videos and learn and hopefully you i mean well, it's not only hopefully i know that a lot of people are using this material already around the world to to do presentations about ssi and create their own local communities and that's exactly the purpose of what we're trying to do and hopefully that that's something that will keep on growing and i think it will continue growing um for the presentation daniel has uh, prepared a very nice slide deck and if you have any questions during the presentation please just use the question tool to just write in your questions and i'll share them with daniel during the presentation i'll, I'll interrupt him during the presentation if not um, you can also bring up any of your questions um, at the end of the presentation so daniel thank you so much for joining us it's a pleasure to have us uh, to have you with us and yeah we all look really forward to 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 learn from what this new initiative is about great thanks for having me so I'll dive right in. Uh, Ion is something that we have been working on now for a while. It's, it's really underpinned by a core protocol called Tetri, uh, whose name is confusing because the tree, the tree data structure is not actually the uh, principal data structure used within it. Uh, but that protocol is a blockchain agnostic protocol for scaling, uh, mostly you know, intended for DID type networks. Ion is the con construction of using that protocol adapted for Bitcoin. Um, so one thing to remember as we go throughout this presentation is that ION is a construct. It uses this core protocol. So 95% of ION's code is really side tree code, which is generic to the blockchain. And we've added the adapter pieces, again, open source adapter pieces that make it run on Bitcoin. You're probably here in, I, I guess I'm told, a week or two from another project uh, by Transmute that uses SciTree, this core code that comprises Zion, um, to do the same thing on top of Ethereum, and they call that network Element. The two are similar in the sense that they use this underlying protocol SciTree. So why do we want to do this? I think it's important to start off not just by telling you about you know, SciTree, Ion, you know, these constructions of, of this particular network type, is to actually address why we even wanted to build it in the first place. And our reason was really around scaling and some of the viability concerns that we had uh, when we looked at using a system of decentralized identity um, at the scale that certainly Microsoft would have to address, right? You, you can have all sorts of niche use cases. You can break things up by vertical. You can do a lot um, to limit the scale that you have to deal with. But, you know, the organization that I have to work for must sort of confront that um, reality up front. Our challenge is how do we create one of these secure decentralized systems that can run at a scale of billions, right? Billions of people, billions of devices. And there's really three critical components to, the central, to, to this equation, which is decentralization, scalability, and security. And it, it's not exactly like Cap Theorem, but you know, generally speaking, these systems, they tend to trade between these three uh, to, to achieve some sort of system state. And we really wanted to see if we could maximize these three attributes and retain you know the core bits that are necessary so you know decentralization right like if you start to give way on decentralization it it just becomes a less interesting less differentiated product or service or network rather than what you might have currently right so microsoft for instance has 
a pretty strong offering in the centralized identity space with Azure Active Directory. So we look at it as if we're going to go and embrace the centralized identity, we've got to be delivering some differentiated value. So the more you centralize it, the more it starts looking like AAD and you've already got a pretty decent solution for that. So you want to maintain a system that is decentralized. It doesn't rely on Microsoft or any other company to continue its existence uh, over the long term. We also wanted something that's scalable. Like I said, you know, we're talking about likely tens of billions of IDs or maybe even more in the maturity. And so it needs to be able to stand up to that load in security. Like, you know, it has to still be as secure some of these underlying systems, you know, the security, for instance, Bitcoin or others that people have come to regard as you know, some of the most secure decentralized systems in the world. So it helps to kind of understand what's the scale that we're talking about. And when we think of decentralized identity, we think of, you know, a couple of different facets. One is human identity. That's the one that you know, typically is getting the most looks right now, right? you know, people having IDs that they can engage in digital exchanges with, whether it's proofs of verifiable credentials or you know application type exchanges, that all kind of center around the human. And that's a big deal. We think everyone's probably going to have at least one identifier, but probably many identifiers that, that keep their exchanges discreet, right? That don't um, correlate them and other things. So if you think about at minimum 7.5 billion humans, we want them to all at least have one ID but probably multiple IDs, you're already dealing with billions. Um, but then if you were saying, you know, it's not just people, it might be devices, uh, applications, services, might even have IDs, really anything that could be manifest as an entity in the world could have an ID. Now you're really talking about scale that is just pretty, pretty massive. So we need a system that is at least capable of this. Now, who knows how successful it will be, you know, as, an, as a community, that if any one of these systems had even a fraction of tens of billions of IDs and traffic, um, if we get there, it's a good problem to have, but we, we wanna be confident, personally with Microsoft, that if we do, if we end up being wildly successful as a community, there are things out there that can address these needs. So what are the requirements for the system really at sort of an objective level? And when I say DPK, I hear the acronym means decentralized public key infrastructure. And the centralized public infrastructure has been something that's been long sought after in the community. If you talk to people that you know, work in identity, what they'll tell you is that the centralized public infrastructure is sort of the underpinnings of the ideal system that you want. And we've attempted this in multiple ways over the years. You know, there's when PGP, um, there's Conix um, that is, you know, something that was produced by primarily Google, but there are probably other people that contributed. And these attempts over the, you know, the past 20 years have all had, you know, various reasons why they really didn't succeed. And some of them are technical, others are just timing. But what DPKI as a core component needs uh, to be successful is really a global immutable pendulum log. So something that uh, deterministically you can look at uh, everyone, every participant in the system can look at and say the state is kept here and we all have one view of it. And if we do whatever computation is necessary uh, or, or storage is necessary uh, on that global immutable log, we can derive a, a singular state, right? Because you don't want to have Alice and Bob saying, well, my ID is in this state and Bob claims his ID is in another state and no one can resolve that problem. So it has to be sort of an oracle in that sense. Uh, we don't we don't desire for there to be central providers or authorities, and when I say we, I you know I believe the decentralized identity community plus Microsoft uh, doesn't want that to be the case, and that includes Ion. You know, on top of Bitcoin, the system is not constructed such that you know you're to ha you have to talk to some centralized server, you have to like gain Microsoft's approval or authority. There's no certificate authority type entities in the Ion network. There's no one that is a validator or any other sort of authority has to sign off on you uh, landing your ID in the network or modifying it in your way. And we also want the system to be censorship and tamper resistant. So it shouldn't be trivial to uh, censor people's IDs from, from making it into the system and from them using those IDs. So key realization we had when we started this work, and the work really started <clears throat> at a um, after event 
a sort of an, I wouldn't say after party, but like a, a little event we had over in Mountain View after one of the days of IW in 2017, I believe it was October. Uh, we're sitting there with some of the folks from IW and from, you know, DIFF and uh, just chatting about, you know, different strategies folks had and how DID methods were shaping up. And there's this idea that, well, hey, what if we, um, what if we like looked at the guts of the problem, right? Like DIDs and DPKI as, as just a technical problem. And we started talking about the table and sort of realized that DIDs and PKI don't have really the same double spend problem that cryptocurrency, for instance, has. Uh, because DIDs don't need to be transferred between parties like assets. Now, some systems, some name type systems and others do uh, want this, this attribute. Uh, but DIDs in general, uh, in the construct of the W3C DID uh, specification, really are not intended to be transferable. So it's like once you create an ID, the entity that created it is essentially typically the owning entity for its entire lifetime. So if you can make that assumption, really all you have to prevent in a system of, of DIDs and DPK is the issuance of IDs and ensuring all parties on the network can you know, derive a single deterministic state for um, so how we kind of set to work thinking, how might these differences in requirements from cryptocurrency, which absolutely you have to agree that the money went from Alice to Bob, um, how might those differences affect the way we approach architecting a network? So provide a technical overview of the system. Um, one thing to you know, set, set straight here is what is, what is this network? Well, it's a public permissionless decentralized ID overlay network that runs on Bitcoin and leverages a deterministic DPI protocol um, side tree. So I, I really emphasize permissionless here. Uh, ION is not permission, even though Microsoft contributes uh, you know, a fair chunk of that code and the majority of that code to DIFF. Uh, the network itself doesn't have any encodings to say, you know, go talk to a Microsoft server or you have to know about this authority. It's really a construct that's more akin to Bitcoin's lightning network where Code is uh, maybe LND commits, uh, Lightning Labs commits a lot of the code to Lightning implementations, but in nowhere in Lightning's code does it say, well, you have to you know, go get light, uh, Lightning Labs approval. Same thing here, right? It's, it's really a mathematical protocol that, that comes alive per node and you know, the owner of the node is the one who controls it, no one else. So some technical assumptions that we might make, uh, there's no secondary consensus in Ion. So, they're sort of like layer two nodes in that lightning sense again, not technically, but spiritually. Um, and there's no consensus among those nodes that's different from the consensus of the underlying target chain, in this case, Bitcoin. Uh, they don't vote, they don't have validators, they don't uh, come to some secondary type of agreement or anything of that nature. Uh, they simply apply a set of deterministic rules. And that leads to the second point of no conflicting states are allowed. So it's not about like, who subjectively agrees what the state is, there's actually a set of strict deterministic rules that if each node follows them, just like one might follow the block size rule in Bitcoin itself, you will achieve the same deterministic state at the end. Whether it's Alice or Bob running their node, not talking to each other, have no idea whether they're on the same network, they're still gonna achieve the same state. And one hard um, fact is that IDs are not transferable between entities. And oddly enough, this is not a technical uh, impossibility. It's not like a technical thing. It's about trust. So the system provides no trustless ability for Alice to, to sign her ID or give her ID to Bob. Um, while it's technically possible, it's not um, network feasible in that sense. So uh, to provide a little system overview, this is kind of what <clears throat> super high level topology looks like in, in ION where basically anyone can run a node, you know, you, you don't know the next node from Adam, uh, there might be hundreds of thousands or you know, tens of thousands of these nodes in the network at scale. Um, they all do sort of the same functions. Some nodes might write to the underlying chain, others will purely observe, we call them just observing nodes. And here's how it kind of works. The, the node one here in this diagram might be a node that does write transactions in the Bitcoin. And those transactions are essentially aggregated batches of DID operations. And when I say DID operations, we're not talking about PII data or any like verbose identity data. You're not writing your name into, the, into these operations. You're not 
writing you know, any information about the ID. It's purely PKI state data. And what that entails is a set of public keys that link to private keys you may hold as the owner of an ID and some endpoints off chain and outside of IAM entirely where someone might you know, look up your ID and then go find more data about your ID if you're willing to tell them. So really IAM is concerned with providing you a means to look up an identifier, get keys that would help you prove if someone does control that identifier and then you know, routing data that lets you go and find where data might be stored about that identifier or someone could disclose to you details about it. Um, so what happens in number one is that, let's say node one, it could be running on Bob's computer, it could be running on Microsoft, who knows, uh, says, hey, you know what, I'm gonna write some, some operations into uh, this underlying chain using this protocol. So they'd form them up into this batch structure. And when they do that, uh, they hash the batch with multi-hash. It's essentially a protocol that you know, has been put in place by IPFS in the planetary file system. And that multi-hash of this batch is written in to Bitcoin. Um, and that hash is actually a hash of this thing called an anchor file. And so what that does is locks one or more operations uh, at that node's discretion, if however many they want to include, into a batch that's represented in the chain as a point in time. So uh, Bob or Microsoft, they can include, you know, I wouldn't say as many as, as they want in the batch, there is an actual max limit, but they could potentially include thousands or tens of thousands of operations in that batch. Why would you want to do that? Well, it just provides a means of economic scalability, right? Like if everyone had to anchor one operation or their ID in one Bitcoin transaction, obviously that's never going to be nearly enough scale, which doesn't address your scale problem. So what might happen in the future is node one might be Microsoft or you know, someone else you trust. It could be like a co-op, who knows, is running one of these nodes and they have, they expose an endpoint that says, hey, you know, I'm willing to take operations from some people that, I, you know, that I'm opening this up to. And so they can gather operations together from people they may not, may not even know. And those people can trust that they can hand their operations to that node because the operations are already signed uh, by keys that the, the owner um, invokes on their client. So the keys are not doled out by the system. You know, it's not Microsoft or any authority that has your private keys. Everything is created in the client, just like you would, you know, sort of set up your own Bitcoin wallet and have your keys on the client. Uh, so when you're giving an operation out to a larger economic node that might be doing this batching, you're not really trusting them for any other purpose other than to actually put your operation in that batch and get it locked into the chain. The worst they can do is to simply not not do what they say. Right? They would not put it in this batch, um, whether maliciously or just simply by um, you know, it, some error in, in their service. And so you can always check that. You can always know and just observe the chain and understand that your operation was or was not included. So it's a pretty light amount of trust that you're putting in. And the fallback, of course, is that you can always run your own node and you could put a transaction in that you know, could get locked into Bitcoin yourself. Um, so it's not like it's, you know, it's not like it's uh, required that you go through some node that's you know, batching a lot of transactions. So in number one here, node one batches transactions, hashes it, gets it into the chain. Um, and then some other node, node two, or thousands of other nodes, are watching the chain and watching for transactions to come through. And what they see is they see, you know, every transaction we're essentially scanning for some data that's embedded within the transaction. It's leading bits that indicate it is an ion bearing transaction. And of course that multi-hash that links to the anchor file and batch file uh, of the operations. And when they come across a transaction that, that is marked as such, they engage the IPFS, the processor and IPFS storage components of the node to go out over the shared IPFS network that node one is broadcasting essentially this batch on um, an anchor file on and go fetch that. So the chain is acting, it, it plays a few roles here. One is it's important for the chronological lineage of these operations. That's actually critical to the, pro, to the protocol that you understand which transaction came before which and which operations are applied and delivered. And it also is a signaling mechanism. So when you see something in the chain that's this multi-hash IPFS hash, uh, it tells all the other nodes how to go find it, how to look it up. So the nodes do communicate with each other in one way, not a consensus, not where they vote to agree on things, but they communicate with each other to go fetch the data and replicate and store it. 
So it is an active mechanism where all the nodes are attempting to essentially replicate the data behind the hashes that finds Bitcoin. Once node two has the data from node one or whatever other nodes have already propagated the data, um, it then processes it in accordance with a set of rules uh, that allow it to essentially determine the states for IDs. So if Alice had you know, created an ID at time zero and at time one, sometime later, she does an update where maybe she rolls a key up, she gets a new phone, she adds a new public key to her IDs association. Um, all the other nodes would see that, process the batch that her ID operation is contained in, and then modify her state accordingly. So what's the anatomy of one of these operations? Well, it's a two-phase um, IPFS hop, basically, from the chain. So if I'm a node and I'm watching the chain, I might see one of these ion transactions, you know, side tree um, mark transactions come through. <clears throat> and the first hash that's actually in the chain is the hash of this anchor file. It's a very small file. It's sort of like a control or config file. Um, it contains a batch hash, a secondary IPFS hash that is the verbose essentially batch of all these operations, which are, is a bit larger, right? We're talking about single digit megabytes um, to get tens of thousands into one you know, batch. And once a node has gone and gotten both of these, uh, it's able to have sort of all the operations that we need to synthesize the current state. The operations themselves are essentially uh, a delta-based CDRT. So like if you just think of operational deltas where you're sort of patching an object. Um, that's what they end up being. So Alice might have five changes to her DID document or state, um, but beyond the initial create, everything else is just a patch on that document. Where it's essentially saying, just change this value or modify this value, not an entire regurgitation of you know, the, the large DID document. There's an important thing to note here. We're not gonna talk about it too much because it gets down to a little bit lower level stuff, but the reason we split out <clears throat> the anchor and batch file is because there's two types of nodes currently that are you know, being developed in the system. There's light nodes and full nodes. And so, you know, some blurring the line between. But light nodes essentially only have to store the anchor file. The anchor file gives you a map to the world so that you can trust, still trustlessly resolve any ID's current state. But all you need to remain trustless is the anchor file, which is a, a very small subset. We're talking about maybe two orders of magnitude less storage to operate a light node. Um, the full nodes that keep all the operational batch data, which is you know, much larger and verbose, those are you know, require more storage. You know, at full state, that may be tens of terabytes. You know, if we're supporting tens of billions or even 100 billion IDs, it's going to be in the terabytes. Uh, but the cool thing is that a light node, you still have that trustless aspect to it. Um, and you can have hybrids as well, things where maybe I, I want to have a light node and then there's a subset of DIDs, like maybe my own and my family's or whoever's in my circles, that I want to optimistically go and get the batch files for in a selective manner. So that I'm essentially persisting over the network, just the ID verbose data of the IDs I care about. Right? So there's, there's some selective ability in there. So let's talk a little bit more about how those operations, you know, Alice's initial create and her changes over time, her patches over time accrue to one deterministic state. Really what SideTree is, uh, the underlying protocol, the underpin sign, is a form of conflict-free resolution data type uh, that allows these operations to converge on one PKI state for a given ID. Um, so if you never really heard of conflict-free resolution data types before, CRDTs are able to sort of deterministically merge changes to an object without a centralized database, like a trusted coordinator, um, which is really cool because it, it'll, there's certainty in it. Everyone comes to the same conclusion based on the, on the deterministic rule set of CRDT. Typically, ordering in these systems uh, of CRDTs, that is ordering is done via vector clocks for Lamport timestamps. So Leslie Lamport is you know, a famous person in this area um, of, of work. And vector clocks are essentially a way that parties can increment a lot, not a wall clock, which you know, when I say wall clock, I mean you know, VTC timestamp or something that's completely arbitrary. What vector clocks allow an observer that's trying to commit to an object the ability to increment a logical clock. Just think about it as an integer that I say, hey, I'm going from state one to two. And if there's multiple committers to a type of object, um, essentially most CDRTs take those logical clocks and they just align them in sequence. And so those 
you know, it's a little less certain, it's a little less global because you could always have some committer out there that's just on their own clock. The cool thing about a blockchain here is that instead of vector clocks or more sub subjective logical clocks, that's actually the, the key of what the blockchain does is the operation batches are anchored in the blockchain and it acts as a decentralized sequencing oracle um, in which orders of operations can achieve this singular deterministic linear history. So that's actually the, the interesting component here and why the blockchain is so essential. There's, you know, the current state of the world is there's a few protocols that do um, proof of publication, right? There's, there's lots of protocols that do sort of fire and forget, right? It's like hash something, put it in the blockchain. That doesn't prove a sequence. That proves that something matching, some data matching that hash existed at that time. And that is definitely a useful, a useful thing, right? But what we're concerned with in this protocol is what was the sequence over time in a way that no actor has to disagree about it. And essentially that's what the blockchain is providing this protocol. So what does ION enable? Like what are the key features that it delivers? <clears throat> well, massive scale, right? So, you know, we're processing tens to even maybe hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of operations a second. Just, and I said, Daniel, just there's a very specific question here. So if it's okay for you, just kind of bring it up. And um, so yeah, yeah. Alex, Alexis is asking, you talk about CRDT used for merging document changes, but from what mm -hmm. I understand, you have a linear set of changes because every change depends on a specific previous state, the kind of blockchain, in which in which case CRDT doesn't really apply, he's arguing. Well, yeah, so no, it, it is a CRDT in the sense it actually uses um, you know, RFC 6902, which is a JSON patch RFC. It's actually a patch that's been around for, patch, uh, format that's been around for a long time. And if you look up, I would encourage any listener to look up delta-based conflict-free resolution data types and just read over it. Um, it is a CRDT in the sense that given a set of a create, which is usually a full create of a document, plus patch objects, which are deltas, you can apply a set of determinist rules that you always can take the first commit and merge subsequent commits. And, and there's little differences in rules, right, between this and a traditional CRDT, which is like, you know, the second commit from the first commit needs to be signed with the valid keys that were present in the document and so forth, right? You always have to have the, the next inbound commit can't just be a random piece of data. It's got to be signed by a valid key that was present in the last state. So there's some nuance here that, that you know, I, I won't dive into, but it certainly is a CDRT in the sense that it's a series of deltas aligned in a deterministic fashion merged into one singular state that any observer could achieve if they simply followed the rules. Does that help? I think so. If not, he will bring it up again, I guess. Thanks. Okay. And that's and that's the key realization here is really the only difference is instead of like ad hoc vector clock um, incrementation and that being the mechanism of series and sequence alignment of these changes over time, we don't have to do that complexity and have the overhead of vector clocks because the blockchain sequences things for us. It essentially determines one order that all commits, um, you know, in a logical time, if that, if that makes sense. So what, what do we have? Well, um, you know, massive scale, obviously like this is, you know, can handle tens, tens to hundreds of thousands of operations per second. I would say that we probably won't need hundreds of thousands of operations per second. And there's some reasons why. A, that's just an, an embarrassingly large amount of total state changes, which doesn't really happen in PKI. Two, um, it's, it's actually a network that is storage limited. So if you were to actually attempt hundreds of thousands of operations per second, you, you would just end up with a ton of storage. Um, one interesting note is you could run at something like 1500 operations per second uh, as a whole network and that would end up being like 100 billion IDs a year, right? That's, that's plenty good. Um, but we wanted to make sure that it's possible. Technically, the protocol could do like anything as long as you had enough hard drives laying around. Um, and I say anything obviously with insane bounds of networks. Um, one interesting note about scale is when we first started doing this with MSR and they were one MSR is Microsoft Research. Um, you know, we brought the ideas to them. We kind of worked with them the whole time on it. Um, one of them ended up calling it sort of this colloquial thing of embarrassingly parallel, right? It's uh, the system itself is embarrassingly parallel in the sense that it's not bottlenecked. Right now, our current bottleneck for the system is literally JSON.parse, um, the functioning node JSON.parse. So we've actually been investigating ways to offload parsing JSON data to GPUs and to you know bare C++ stuff because right now it's a high-level TypeScript implementation. Um, and if you can scale that up, that's essentially inbound bottleneck. 
Um, it's very cost efficient. So the proto all can obviously pack you know, tens of thousands of ops into one Bitcoin transaction. So when people talk about how do you deal with the cost in, of that, um, my question or, or what I would say to folks is there's a hugely different, there's a huge difference between what you anchor in Bitcoin. If you're anchoring a bunch of just pure log data, that's like, I don't know, let's say it's Phillips and they're just flipping a light switch on and off and they want to like flip every time it was logged to have proof of publication. Those, those logging, um, those pieces of logging data have to be pretty valuable, right? How valuable are they is the question, right? How much does someone value every one of those instances that you're sort of anchoring in the chain? Turns out with identity, it's incredibly valuable, right? Like if I had 20,000 operations anchored in one Bitcoin transaction, even if that Bitcoin transaction cost $10, right? And I had 10,000 operations, we're talking about pennies for each person. That could be mean an operation when you get a new phone and you want to roll the keys so that your new phone can be the share of your ID. Right now, SIM cards cost far more than that, right? And they're actually, you know, it makes its way into your bill. You have to go get a new SIM or any new piece of information that updates your quote unquote PKI state out with Verizon or you know, AT&T. Um, so this is not unlike uh, systems of today. There is a cost to these things, but the, the interesting thing about PKI is that it's incredibly valuable information as opposed to other things which may not be so valuable on an atomic level. Um, just think about the fact that like if say Jeff Bezos was a part of a system like this and had a DID, and he needed to roll in his phone to get a new key associated with his ID so that his new phone could you know, have, have that power. Um, I think I think Jeff Bezos would probably be willing to pay like a hundredth or a thousandth of a cent, right? He's, he's probably okay with that to be secure and have his ID secured by that key. Um, so that's kind of how you have to think about you know, the cost efficiencies and the value. Now it's permissionless. Um, some other blockchain systems may rely on authorities or authority networks. Ion's able to meet these requirements without you know, in, injecting sort of this validator network. Um, flexible nodes. One super cool thing about this is ION is differential. So like I talked about before, if you're running a light node and only storing those anchor files, um, that's a, a two orders of magnitude smaller than the actual proposed data, um, you can still maintain this trust of state. Now the cool thing about it is you can optimistically go out and grab more state of the network, more verbose state if you want. So let's say I'm in some insurance company and I only want to go replicate the state of people who are the verbose state of people who are my customers. I can go do that when a new customer signs up. I can go say, well, now I care about Joe's ID. So let me go grab all of Joe's operational batches and I'll persist those as well. And so the network starts to form this sort of, um, and I'll go go into building the network. Uh, the network starts to form this sort of sea of Venn diagrams where everyone can contain you know, as much verbose state as they want, as long as they have this trustless um, you know, light node capability. And that could end up being for individuals. It could be like your friends and family, and they're going to retain their state for medium sized businesses. It could be their customers, potentially their partners and their suppliers, that sort of thing. So it's very organic. It's not like an all or nothing like a blockchain where you're saying, I literally have to have like the equivalent of an Ethereum archival node or nothing, right? There's, there's a lot of variable. So building the network. Uh, Ion is like this organic system that require, you know, requires care, develop, grow, and flourish, and we realize that. So, so how are we going to do that? How are we building the network out? Um, protocol development and network upgrades. This is going to be the approach in the community to doing this, and this is kind of a, a new proposal here. Um, the major the major version dot is going to be protocol evolution. So advancements, they're so large, they might require a separate code base entirely. We're talking about things that rarely going to happen, right? Um, you know, Bitcoin's still at like point. Um, so this is not something we expect to be using often if in the foreseeable future. Um, forks and required upgrades would be the minor. And so critical updates, um, forking changes or high security patches that require all nodes to upgrade. That's when we're going to be revving that part of the version. And then lastly, uh, discretionary updates. So this might happen more frequently where these are non-critical changes. Maybe they're just for slight performance increases or things of that nature. And you're not forced to upgrade. It's not gonna change you know, your view of the protocol or your view of the network or fork you off. You just do it when you're, when you're ready. The upgrade process that the community is gonna proceed under is tagging the release, um, updating all the install guides, uh, adding an entry to the change log that has you know, all the requisite stuff you would need as a node operator to be able to you know, upgrade your node, 
and then broadcasting the upgrade to all the node operators. Um, and obviously, at a certain scale, you can't personally talk to everyone running a node out there, just like you couldn't with Lightning. Um, but there'll be social channels and things through Diff and you know other avenues that we try and get the word out. So what is what's the path to a robust network? We think this is kind of like a three-stage journey. Um, stage one is we think larger entities will come in and run these nodes to jumpstart the network. So lots of people maintain the full state that have like I wouldn't say a staking network, not a like proof of stake, but like they're interested in it. You know, it might be a company that says, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to be in decentralized identity, so I'm gonna run one of these nodes, or hey, I'm gonna be a major relying party. Uh, that issues credentials based on these decentralized IDs. So I want to run you know, one of these full nodes. Um, stage two, you might have entities with product needs and early adopter hobbyists that start running full nodes ad hoc. You know, you don't know who they are. They're not advertising themselves. They just kind of come into being uh, because they might have actual needs around it um, that are tactical. And then stage three, you know, there's a long tail end users. Um, organizations that might run a mix of light and full nodes or somewhere in between, depending on their set configuration. And that's, you know, obviously the state that we want to be in. Uh, lastly is how to get involved. So, you know, come help shape the specifications. Um, you know, we need to make sure that, that the system works for everyone. We want it to work from, you know, the person who can run the light node reference client, which is something that you know, might be able to run on like a little Intel knock at home on a decent internet connection, all the way up to you know, people who want to run full nodes and maintain all those terabytes of data for the entire earth and instantly be able to cache, cache and resolve in all states. Uh, we want to make sure the protocol can do all of those things. So come help work on it. Um, contribute to the open source development uh, at you know, in diff via the side tree protocol and the ion node construction on top of Bitcoin. And like you'll hear about from SSI Meetup here uh, coming up, the Elements Ethereum-based network. You can also contribute there. It's also out of GIF. Um, and then run a node and participate in the ecosystem. So in order to realize the value that we really want, it takes a lot of people running nodes because this system fundamentally is based on the replication of those operational batches. So whether we have a lot of full nodes, some nodes that keep like a medium, you know, some full state or just light nodes, we, we need enough in the network that we can always say there's, you know, tons of redundancy, years, as it were, of all the diverse operations there. So that's how to get involved. Uh, we'd love to have any participation that folks in the community are willing to offer. Um, definitely look us up in DIFF. Everything is open source and open on the repos there. Uh, and we're looking forward to get people involved in calls and other activities coming up. That is all I have. Great. And um, yeah, um, we have a number of questions that have accumulated here. So Great. if you if we want, we, we can get started on those and, mm -hmm. and, and let's do that. And um, so Roman, he's, he's, he asked two questions, but he, um, um, Roman, let me know if you want to ask the first one too, but then he simplified his question later. So he said, given a large enough off-chain attack surface, the value mm -hmm. of the Bitcoin network or the token might be in, insufficient to secure the overlay network. How would that mismatch be handled? So I, I guess I would have to ask what, maybe for some clarification, does, does he mean that when you say off-chain attack surface, um, what what can, I'm not sure I understand, because like there's attacking Bitcoin itself, which, you know, that attack surface doesn't really change, right? The Bitcoin code is the Bitcoin code. We're not trying to ask them to change anything about that code. Um, so that that's sort of, is the same. I'm not sure whether he's asking if Ion uh, draws more attacks to Bitcoin, or if he's saying that Ion has a unique attack surface itself that somehow you know impacts Bitcoin. So that's that's the clarific clarification I would ask. Yeah, he, he was just adding right now um, um, that he's talking about the value of identity secured by Ion, and mm -hmm. similarly to how a root certificate. Uh, um, certification authority certificate is very valuable. Um, hmm. I would say that ions, you know, so there's no, there's no like, the interesting thing about ion nodes is there's, you don't know who a node is, right? You don't know, oh, this, this node that's anchoring operations is, is more valuable or a root node versus some other node, right? It's just people forming up uh, operational batches and hashing those and putting those hashes in the chain and offering them up on that secondary network that meet a protocol. So anyone can jump in and, and add those. Uh, I would say that 
uh, I might go into a little bit of detail. So if we talk about the value of the actual, you know, batches, um, these anchor files that are hashed and put in the chain, those actual on-chain transactions that embed those hashes might be very valuable. And the protocols actually has this proof of fee component to it, where depending on the number of ops you want to inject into the system via a batch, you have to actually pay a, a per op fee um, that's calculated based on a, a moving window into Bitcoin's fee fields. So basically like the, the leftover, the fee that goes to the miners, right, has to be a, a certain size that is equivalent to how many operations you want to anchor. So A, this keeps spam down, because if you're a spammer, the cost to anchor a batch of one versus the cost to anchor a batch of 10,000 is actually variable. Like it, it's, it increases um, with the number of operations you want to anchor, um, which also has this interesting side effect in, in the sense that as you pay more in fee, uh, ion transactions will float to the top of the list. Like obviously miners want to mine the, you know, the transactions with the, the most significant fees. Um, so naturally the transactions, the ion transactions will, will tend to float to the top. That's at least our theory. Okay. Uh, we, we have a, another question here from Alexis. Um, Alexis is asking two questions now. Um, um, how, how, do, how do you deal with Sybil attacks on full nodes? While Bitcoin doesn't store huge documents, Ion full nodes actually store all document changes. And in addition to that, he's also asking, is this fee at most the Bitcoin transaction fee? Okay, so good question. So we will get into the weeds a little bit. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's totally fine. So I, I, I do want to make a point that to be a trustless node, to trustlessly be able to resolve all IDs, all you need to anchor is, all you need to um, persist is the anchor file. So anchor files is again, orders of magnitude smaller than the batch file. Um, I'll give you a rough number, like for 75 billion to 100 billion ID, IDs supported in the system, you're talking about a node that might be a one terabyte, you know, maybe a little over one terabyte. And that's to trustlessly resolve all of those. Now the batch files backing those may be verbose and large. Um, so there's a, there's a difference there and you have a gradient. So you can store more batch files if you want to, you know, kind of ad hoc to, to have IDs, operational data quickly at the ready and cached, right? Um, now, how, how do we prevent spam with that? It's not like just an open IPFS network. You're not just saying, I'm gonna you know, replicate everyone's cat pictures or something. You're only replicating the data that makes its way from the chain that's anchored there in accordance with the protocol and passes all the checks. And so when we talk about the checks, that's where that operation, per operation fee comes in. So the per operation fee is like, is per literally per operation in the batch. So if I had one operation, it's gonna be a very small fee, right? Maybe it's just uh, a few penny, pennies, whatever it takes to get into Bitcoin. At a certain point, thousands of operations in a batch, I'm going to be uh, purposefully overpaying, right? To be adherent to the protocol. Because what the protocol is gonna do is say, great, um, you, you paid a fee of, let's say the current fee is 50 cents and you paid $5, right? $5 is going to give you a lot of freedom to have a batch X size, right? Of X size that depends on that fee. If the node goes and pulls the batch and the batch has way more ops than that, it literally drops it on the floor. It's basically invalid. It just says, nope, you didn't pay the requisite fee that's tied to that number of operations. So I'm going to discard everything you did. No one in the network is going to replicate that and you're done. Um, so there is that, that metering, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, if not, Alexis, please keep on following up. We have another question here from Mike. Mike is asking, is Ion, as you've, impl uh, as you've implement, as you, oh, okay, is Ion uh, an implementation of Bitcoin, just uh, just the first implementation of Sidetree, and do you expect it to be used on other public net networks like Ethereum? Is this the DID implementation and an alternative to DID networks like Indy Sovereign? So, um... I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this you know, on both fronts. So Sidetree is a totally generic um, piece of, you know, I would call it almost like CDRT style um, layer two overlay protocol for anchoring operations, which we're using for DIDs. Um, it doesn't really have any, until you marry like Sidetree's like the body of code up to a chain and add some adapter code, that's also open source in Ryan's case and in the Ethereum, the Ethereum version's case, you don't really have a DID network. So you got to put them together. You got to put the bits in to Bitcoin, you got to put the, put the ion 
or I'm sorry, the side code with it, then you have ION. Um, so yeah, it is a generic construct that can be applied to any blockchain or ledger. We've chosen to apply to Bitcoin first because it's you know largest network. It's got you know it's been around forever. It's pretty trusted. Um, that said, you can take SideTree as generic and you can apply that protocol to other blockchains. In fact, Transmute, a member of Diff, has done this with Ethereum. Um, they've created a construct they call their network Element, and that's under you know current work by them. It's in Diff. You can contribute to that if you prefer. You know the incarnation of this underlying protocol on top of Ethereum. That's a good good group to uh, get started with. Okay, is it like I mean, if 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 you run uh, an Iron network and an Element network that is running on Ethereum, would those two networks be compatible or or not? Um, well, it depends on what you mean by compatibility. I mean, technically, in their guts, they they share a ton of code, right? Because the deterministic rule set inside of uh, SideTree is not is not changed, right? It's, it's the same rule set that says here's how we determine state. There's the underlying adapters for the the target chains that they're working on top of that you know are different. Like, how do I read? Um, I don't forget what they call it. In how do I read transactions or quote unquote log entries? I guess the log entry in Ethereum. How do I read transactions in Bitcoin? How do I write to that log through a smart contract in Ethereum, or how do I write to Bitcoin through the UTXO style transaction? Um, so there's differences there, and that's sort of the that's where the most code difference happens between incarnations, is where they marry up to the chain. Everything else is pretty much exactly the same. So like the IPFS stuff doesn't change, the uh, you know, internal logic doesn't change. So when we talk about compatibility, um, they're compatible in the sense that they're initiatives that share a lot of code so hopefully those dev groups and we are working with transmute and others um, that are working on these constructions do talk to each other and we're all contributing the same basic code base uh, in terms of compatibility like did to did because the output is did documents uh, inherently they're just as compatible as if you said ion versus sovereign or something like that they're all outputting did documents as networks so they're all inherently compatible via that standard okay um, um, question from Drummond. Um, um, so, so if Ion is permissionless, how do I know I can rely on the network? How do I know who's running nodes? What, what's the incentive to run a node? So, great question. Um, you, you don't know all who who is running a node. Right? You just like you don't know everyone in the world who might be running an IPFS node. Um, you probably have a good idea of you know several trusted entities that might be running nodes because they'll tell you, like Microsoft said. Hey, um, you know, first batch of people that agreed to run the network, and when I say agreed, there's no like legal agreements or anything. But you know, we've got um, Cloudflare, you know, um, Equinix, you know, several others. Um, T-Mobile is one that we're talking to about the T Labs folks. Um, they're they're running it because they're like, hey, you know what? There'll probably be several DID networks that we're interested in. So this is one of them. Um, it's about how robust you grow the network. Uh, in terms of why they would do it, there's a lot of business goals that drive that. Like Microsoft wants this to be one op option along with Sovereign. Like we're we're hoping we want to support these other networks like Sovereign, Ethereum-based constructions that aren't side tree based. Um, so we think that you know we're a neutral party. We're gonna we're not saying this is the only one that's gonna exist, the only one you should run. But the goal and the reason why people run nodes is business, is business reasons, right? You want to access uh, trustless access to a network, you gotta run a node. And for a lot of businesses that might, you know, might be running a light or a full node, a light node being basically, I mean, it's super cheap versus a full node, which might be like a few thousand dollars a year, right? If at huge scale, are, are companies like Microsoft or even medium-sized companies going to balk at having trustless access to billions of IDs if it costs them a few thousand dollars a year? Um, I would, I would posit to you in a theoretical economic sense, probably no. Um, if they're not able to derive a few thousand dollars worth of value every year um, from DIDs net, you know, at large, then I don't know if DIDs are going to you know, work out in the end. So I would say most companies have, are going to drive more than a few thousand dollars worth of value. So that's why they're going to put a few thousand dollars in. Okay. Um, did, I mean, just thinking aloud, Daniel, um, in the way you painted the, the, the pictures, like initially you, you have these um, bigger company institutional nodes um, that, that are running um, the iron network and in, in a way that, that kind of looks like a lot like like a permission network. I mean, at, at least in the initial stage. Um, I mean, I understand that those are 
they, they can decide to become nodes without any uh, without asking to become part of the network. But I understand that initially it would be something more like this. So really until it doesn't get into stage three, where you have a very wide, broad network um, with many different types of nodes connected and many people participating for their own reasons, you wouldn't really, uh, in a way, maybe you couldn't really call this permissionless. In reality, what you're doing is you're running uh, uh, an overlay network on top of a permissionless network, but the overlay network in itself is not really permissionless. Well, I don't see how that could possibly be true, right? Because I mean, it, it really depends how you're defining permissionless. There's no permissions to run a node and participate in replicate state and have trust this ability in the network. Zero, right? There's absolutely none. Um, so permissionless, there are no permissions, so I would inherently say permissionless. If you would say, if I don't want to even, let's say I don't want to run any node at all. I literally don't want to have any software on my computer that you know ensures any trust guarantees. Well, yeah, if you're just going to call some you know REST API and just trust some other node, it's not permissioned. You're just not wanting to do any work at all to be trustless. Um, we are designing systems so that's not the case. And without even blinking, we got you know a dozen um, institutions that could probably replicate this data at massive scale, and, and that was like with, without trying, right? So. We think you know we'll get to and when I say stage one stage this isn't like years and years of uh, you know it's only Microsoft running a node. We think that's that stage one stage two could progress very quickly. Like we could see relying parties hop on board. Um, the reality is that and I'll just make this broad statement and others have agreed with me about this. The DID ecosystem probably in terms of the broadly supported DID networks and mechanisms will follow something like a power law curve, same as the internet did. Right, you have TCP, UDP, you have HTTP, and a bunch of other competitors, HTTP like Gopher and all these other things. Um, eventually, you sort of consolidate, not by you know malicious reasons, that people just sort of go a core set, maybe three to five or some handful that fulfill all their needs, and then those tend to be like you know the selections that most people use. Right? I think that probably will happen. Who knows if Ion's one of those? I don't know. Right? It probably, no matter what they are, it will occur. Where people are like, oh, this network is pretty robust. I'll you know use this, or I want to use this one. And so we think that that sort of um, that that sort of uh, dynamic is probably what's going to drive like maybe some of the more scalable networks or the ones that are supported, some of the ones that might have more business baked uh, legal frameworks might be you know ones that that rise to the top. Who knows? But that's our thesis: is that if this is seen as having attributes that people really, really want, or at least a major um, minority of folks want, then it'll probably be one of the bigger networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hear you. It, it, I think one of the outstanding questions would still be like the incentive scheme, because in the, in the way Bitcoin has been set up, I mean, and it's incredibly difficult to do that, is that um, everything kind of fits together. Like mm -hmm. the answer you gave so far about what incentives are is like, well, we expect businesses to, to extract some value for um, out of this. Yeah. Um, but still, I mean, um, yeah. it, it just might only happen. I, so let me, I'll talk about that yeah. really quick. So, so let's say, what's my incentive to uh, replicate OAuth tokens and to uh, keep a user table full of IDs that may be federated and live actually on Google servers? I mean, mm -hmm. surely, gosh darn it, they, they're using Facebook Connect and they're using Google to log in. What's my incentive? I, I'm a competitor to those companies. My gosh, I have databases with terabytes of existing PKI, centralized PKI data that I'm happy to replicate because I want people to log in. And it's a very valuable function, it turns out. Um, that, that's the incentive. If we're asking like, is logging in or authenticating users for valuable interactions enough of an incentive? I would absolutely tell you yes, uh, because everyone does it today. The, the best systems are the ones where you don't have to convince someone of a new incentive. If I wrote a DAP called um, uh, replicatemycatvideos.com or .dap or whatever the hell they're called, I might have a problem because now I have to convince everyone in the world to replicate a bunch of crappy cat videos that probably no one cares about. Um, it's a different animal with DIDs and PKI. People want to replicate core authentication data because they want to be able to do business in the most fundamental sense, which all starts at the handshake with those individuals. So I would say that, that identity is a specific and special animal at its core foundational PKI level where people are naturally incentivized to want to replicate the network and be able to have a trustless interaction with another being for the purpose of value on top. And so that's my, that's my game theoretical like um, economic postulation to you 
is that identity is not cat videos and you can't make the statement who will pay for the decentralized web in some generic sense because trying to lump all data together as if like I have to care about it the same as cat videos is probably not not really realistic if that makes sense okay we're just gonna do a quick experiment we never did it so sure. far uh, Alexis he, he's asking if he can jump in via voice and I think he yeah. had some good yeah. questions and um, so I'm just gonna mm -hmm. give him access to, to, to talk and Alexis, just keep it, please, brief to the questions, and then um, we, let's try to keep it interesting for everyone. Yeah. So I'm gonna give you access now. Just let let me see if this works. Can can you talk? Can Alexis? you hear me? Yeah. Can you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Just a couple of questions more related to the fees because it wasn't clear mm -hmm. to me. I um from what I had been looking into the Ion projects, um the fee the the you know that Bitcoin is decentralized and nothing stops me from creating uh, several huge batches and following the ION, the Cytri protocol in the mm -hmm. same way that ION does and publish yeah. everything to the to the Bitcoin network and the IPFS network. Mm -hmm. And at the end, ION is trusting whatever he, it can validate from the Bitcoin network and is not communicating directly with any other ION nodes. So in this specific case, the fee is the maximum of the transaction fee from the Bitcoin network, which is not really huge. No, so that's so that there's a couple of misconceptions there. Um, one okay. is that the fee, like I said, there's actually a per operation fee that the protocol will begin assessing. So um, when I say per operation fee, I, I'm talking about Bitcoin. People add fees to get into the Bitcoin network, right? Let's talk about <clears throat> that's a reality. So just to get into the Bitcoin network, orthogonal of ION, there's a fee, right? What ION does is impose a deterministic per operation fee. And when I say operation, I mean every one of the operations in maybe a 20,000 operation batch on top. So let's say the fee to get into Bitcoin for the next block is 10 cents. Um, if you try to go anchor a block, uh, you know, batch of 30,000 operations, your fee assessment may be way higher than 10 cents. So what you have to do is overpay the fee in Bitcoin. And if you don't overpay the fee in accordance with the you know the size of batch that you're trying to anchor your batch is literally as all the other nodes would assess dropped it essentially doesn't meet the protocol right like you did not pay the requisite fee irrespective of that the bitcoin fee may be much lower now secondarily there's actually a match batch cap so we're not just saying it's an unbounded system or else you could say you know what i'm willing to dump a bunch of money like i'm willing to just pay a bunch of money to try and spam the network so i might say gosh i want to do a batch of a billion well there's just actually a, a flat cap so um, over a certain number of megabytes or operation count, um, you just can't in one transaction uh, do more than that. So it, it doesn't profit you because all the other nodes would just see it as an invalid batch. If that makes sense. Um, is that okay. I think so, Alexis. If not, um, please jump in again. Um, I, I have to. to um, oh, you seem he seems to be muted. Oh, no, can, now you can talk. Yes, yeah. I wasn't able to mute. Thank you. Yes, that makes sense. So just just to be sure, you are talking that there is no in no no specific token to ION, but you are only overpaying the fee which goes to the Bitcoin miners. So ION right. nodes are not actually getting any revenue from what I understand. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, the ION nodes don't derive, yeah, they don't derive revenue and they essentially if a writer, an ION node is a writing node and wants to get into the network, it has to pay a fee, not just Bitcoin fee but a few requisite you know, tied to how many ops they want the network to consume yeah. that makes perfect sense thank you yeah great um so if if anyone has any more questions please jump in quickly i, ha I have a couple of more questions for you daniel um if, if we compare this to 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 the um lightning network um mm -hmm. To which extent is, is this comparable to Lightning? Was it just like a second layer metaphor and that's it? Or is or is it like more than that? I would say, yeah, no, it's really, when I talk about Lightning, it, it is not the same protocol. It does not, um, you know, it doesn't like lock transactions and do like uh, like updates in the same way. It's, it's, it's spiritually like Lightning in the sense that you can start a Lightning node and lock value with another person. You don't have to ask anyone. You just have to follow the rules in terms of opcodes and everything else that you do in Bitcoin. And you have to run this piece of software, you know, called Lightning. Um, and that's that's the extent of what I mean, uh, just a level okay. set. 
Okay. There's a couple of more questions from Alexis. It's just going to read uh, to the three of them. Do, do you plan to support multiple cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin? Is there any work related to recovering an identity where the keys are lost? Any security aspects that we must be aware of? Okay. So um, let's see. In terms of supporting cryptocurrencies, we don't particularly view this, and this is you know coming from Microsoft's, Microsoft's perspective, we don't particularly view this as like supporting a cryptocurrency. It's more like you know, right now we did a construction, we had to pick, uh, you know, a blockchain for some network to live on. Uh, Bitcoin's the one that, you know, most people know. So that's Bitcoin. It um, has a good track record, been around for a long, long time, operates at, you know, obscene number of nines for a decentralized network. Makes sense. We had someone come right up into the wings and implement it on Ethereum. That was cool to see given Ethereum's, you know, a lot of people in the Ethereum community want to use um, that construct. Great. Um, I don't look at this as like you know going out and trying to support a currency. It's more of like let's support users. Users want choice. Users want uh, variability. There's a lot of users in Bitcoin. A lot of users in Ethereum. Kind of makes sense, right? That sort of thing. Okay. And then the other question that I, I kind of couldn't. Yeah, remember. I just uh, I just gonna repeat it. Is there any work related to recovering an identity where the keys are lost? Yeah, so this is, I mean, it doesn't really have to do with ION in any serious sense. There is what's called, you know, if you see in this slide, there's update payloads. There's such thing as a recovery, but really what a recovery is, is if you, in your DID document, let's say I'm Alice and I have a key that I've specified, a public key to be my recovery key. Essentially, the protocol just treats it as a trump card. It's like, you know, you might have some keys that are tied to your phones or something. And if you ever lose one or something bad happens that you want to recover control of your ID, you might post a transaction using that master key uh, that recovers control to you. Now, Microsoft is doing some work in this area. We have a forthcoming and new cryptographic scheme that we've coded up. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's like if you took all the best features out of mnemonics and Shamir and put them into a new scheme that isn't based on the underlying foundations of Shamir or mnemonics, um, but something new, it is, it makes the, it might make possible for people to recover their keys in more human ways that are more feasible for, for average users. But that technical construction is separate from ION. Like ION doesn't care how, where that public private key is stored behind that public recovery key. It's just looking for a signature that's valid against it. So we're, we're working as a company and as an ecosystem on other solutions for, for the secret recovery, but that's not technically tied to ION. Right. Then, um, any security aspects that we must be aware of? Um, you know, I mean, there's always there's always uh, fun security uh, talk we can have in terms of like, hey, IPFS, they still call their stuff alpha or beta. I forget what stage they're at now, but they're you know they're not calling it um, you know, one thousand percent reviewed and you know, you know stake all your claims and stuff. Um, but to, to an extent, that software is right. I mean, Gmail's in beta for like I think five hundred years. So. Um, <laughs> so to a certain extent, there's always going to be things throughout the protocol and parts of the stack that like you always have to harden and pay attention to. But there's nothing, there's nothing any different than the sum of its parts, right? There's IPFS, that's a protocol. There's Bitcoin itself. Um, these are the pieces you're trusting. Other than that, really all Sidetree and Ion bring to the fore is a, a special little um, deterministic protocol rule set. And those rules are relatively, I don't know, benign, I guess I would call it. They're not like, it's not the sexiest, smartest thing you've ever seen. I mean, I'm, there's no Einstein stuff going on inside it. So, you know, just take a look and you can see the surface area. Great. Um, when, when you run uh, an iron node, it, it, it does it, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to have a, a Bitcoin node, right? So basically the composition from what, what I could see in your slides is you have a transaction writer, a processor and and an IPF storage. Those are the three elements that you run as an iron node, but it doesn't need to have a Bitcoin um, node. No, no, that's inferred. It's inferred that you're running uh, a node of the underlying target chain. So in, if it was Bitcoin, the ION node, like the actual software out there, does inside of it have a Bitcoin node. Now you can be, we're going to add some uh, options so you can maybe aggressively prune so you can get the storage size down. Like there, there are things that, you know, that you can do to make it so you're not running the same type of Bitcoin node that like, uh, you know, I don't know, Coinbase or something might be running. Um, but yeah, you do have to have access to the Bitcoin network uh, if you're going to run a node okay. either in white mode or in full. Could, could you outline just, I mean, you explained it a little bit, but we just get to hear it again. 
um, um, the functions of the transaction writer, the processor, and the IPFS storage uh, function, like if those are the three main elements besides the Bitcoin full node itself. Yeah, so the transaction writer, what that's doing is saying, hey, whoever started me up as an IAM node, it could be on Alice's laptop, for instance, right? Um, whoever started me up as an IAM node, I need to uh, formulate one or more operations into a batch file, craft a, an anchor file, right? And then I take that hash and I'm going to write in a Bitcoin transaction. And however many operations I have in my batch file, that's how high at least minimum fee needs to be um, in the next Bitcoin transaction that contains it. And so I anchor it in the chain with a normal Bitcoin transaction, pay the requisite fee. Um, the other nodes see that transaction coming through. They engage the processor to kind of say, oh, look, I see a, you know, I see a, a, a Bitcoin transaction that appears to have an IAM payload in it. Cool, let me try to go get that hash. And at that point, they're going back to node one or whoever anchored it or however many nodes have already propagated that data. And they're saying, hey, please, you know, I need that data. And so they get it. And they say, great, I'm going to cache it locally. So obviously there's a replication component here. Everyone, it's not just fire and forget or trust IPFS is like a magical pony. You're saying, I'm going to store this data um, and I'm going to essentially process it in accordance with the rules. And if you're in a white node, you're storing the anchor file. If you're in a full node, you're storing the anchor file plus the batch file. And those are how the components work together. Great. Um, I have one more question here from, uh, from Alexis. He's asking, identity hubs are supposed to store information without actually being able to know what they're storing. But if a key is compromised, all of the encrypted information from this key is compromised too. Have you looked into any possible mitigation? So again, so this is a good question, but I think what they're inferring is actual identity data. So ION does not contain identity data. It doesn't contain your name. It's not, it doesn't contain your favorite color. It doesn't have any of that stuff in it. <clears throat> That's all in completely different systems. So in the DID landscape, your DID document contains these things called service endpoints. We think those are going to link to things like identity hubs, personal data stores, and agents in, in the Aries sort of um, parlance. And that's where your actual like verbose PI identity data interactions are going on. If someone gets a hold of your key or somehow like fundamentally compromises you, there's nothing on ION they're going to unlock. There's no like secret data you've hidden out there that they're going to decrypt. Um, ION is a PKI network. It doesn't go to that depth. All that stuff is off chain um, in completely different, more, more or less traditional services uh, that may run as a centralized services or centralized or whatever. It's up to you as the user where you put your stuff, basically. Right. Um, we have Rakesh asking, uh, what's the roadmap for integration with other blockchains? Um, right now, we don't. Given the fact that Transmute has stood up as an awesome uh, community contributor and said, hey, you know, we're interested in doing this on Ethereum and solve some of our needs, uh, we basically, you know, this is coming from Microsoft, we, we covered the two largest um, communities as we, you know, if you just look at like market share and the, you know, developer buy and that sort of thing. Those are clearly the two largest. I know people get passionate about their cryptocurrencies, but I think people would make would be hard pressed to argue that Bitcoin and Ethereum together didn't comprise the vast majority. Um, so from our perspective, we don't have like a roadmap for going and trying to like do this with other, you know, other blockchains or anything like just because we don't have any customers right now, right? A large set of customers saying, please give me chain X with this construct. Um, if I guess if at some point they did, like if you got a bunch of customers in Microsoft said, hey, we really like you know, chain X, we would like this to exist, they would have to justify that in terms of how much value they think it's going to create and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Alexis is asking, um, on integrating other blockchains, wouldn't it be simpler to use the standard Bitcoin client instead of um, Bcoin? Well, I, I guess he, he means Bitcoin. Uh, or like iron, which can be configured to work in other chain. Bitcoin has non-standard behavior and APIs. Oh, I don't know Bitcoin. Yeah, okay. So basically we just switched away from Bitcore, which was like, it's basically Bitcoin underlies, um, is, is still the underlying chain, but there's like these little wrappers um, that help you with certain API calls. At first it was Bitcore uh, that was on top of Bitcoin and, and you know that was really bloated. So they just moved to Bitcoin, which is much, much, much thinner. Um, doesn't create as much storage in the database and all this stuff. Um, there's only a couple calls that that are different than um, just straight up Bitcoin Core, right? Um, and it's RPC stuff. So we we want to eventually get to a point where we don't need any of these intermediary API wrapper type libraries um, that sit in the middle. Uh, we'd love to just talk to, 
the Bitcoin core, at least for Ion. Um, so that's that's in the cards, I think, for the future. It's just right now there's a couple of calls that we're using um, from that interface. Beautiful. Two more questions, um, Daniel. Um, how, what, what has the reception been from the Bitcoin ecosystem? Uh, how, how have they reacted to this? I mean, because the way you explained this, I mean, if this is successful, it will be incredibly beneficial to the Bitcoin ecosystem because you would be ha you would increase the number of people around the world running phone notes at least um, dramatically. The way I understood it. So, um, uh, what what have you seen so far? You know, I I, um, I really respect the community and I respect them enough that I I don't feel it's my it's my um, duty or or I should feel uh, <laughs> I don't feel like I should speak on behalf of the community in that sense. Um, obviously, we've seen some good, good positive pickup from some people. There's been, uh, oh, some people say, hey, this is spamming Bitcoin. We think we could support the world's transactions in like single digit percentages of the Bitcoin block space could, you know, serve an entire world of people and devices and other things. So we think the trade off's pretty good. And obviously, I see transactions as being a resource. And if you could do really valuable things with the resource, it's making that network stronger. That's my personal view. Other people may disagree with that. And I, I know that there are people who disagree with that. Um, we've seen a lot of positive, though. I, I don't want to speak for the network in, in general, though. I just don't think it's my place. Right. Um, I, I have one more question coming in, one more question for me, and then I, I, we will let you go because we're a little bit over time. Um, how, how, do, how do you see, um, Rakesh is asking, how do you see collaboration um, um, on Iron and Sovereign to achieve scalability? Um, Iron and Sovereign, say again? How do, Iron... how, how, how do you see a collaboration on Iron? And sovereign to achieve, to achieve scalability. Um, I don't. I would have to. I guess I just wonder. Like it seems like some high-level generic terms, right? Like uh, we would always try and support primitives that help all networks. Um, if let's say I don't know, let's say Sidetree or this underlying piece of code helped sovereign. Uh, great. Like you know, I I hope it's I hope it's beneficial to everyone. It's open source. It's uh, patent free. It's royalty free. It's it's there for the community. Um, we don't actively talk about like the two, the scale components of both of those ledgers, like in coordinated calls or anything, not because you know, I'm opposed to that, but just, you know, it just hasn't happened. So if anything we do can benefit other groups and their approaches, then, uh, you know, I, I hope it does. Because at the end of the day, my goal is to have a robust ecosystem for decentralized identity, right? Um, I, I don't have a lot of sacred cows. There's not a lot of hills to die on. Um, I think IONS is going to be a cool option, but I'm totally supportive of people using whatever code we produce in whatever way they can. Um, final question. Um, um, I mean, Microsoft seems to have been like, um, and, 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 and you seem to be one of the big architects in making this happen, um, and one of the first tech big tech companies that, that has kind of used, or is trying to use the Bitcoin network actively um, um, and uh, to, to benefit from it. Uh, I mean, I, I see it in a positive way. Um, um, I mean, how has this work been internally? Because a lot of companies, they've been struggling in, 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 in getting um, internal buy-in, like to use a public network that, um, that some governments or some corporations have seen in, in, in a questionable light. So uh, how, how have you been dealing with that? Or, or has that not been an issue at all? Um, it I, I don't know, internally, you know, we had talks about, you know, how, what, what networks we support, how do we even view this? I, I think for us, it was like, what are the, where are the most users? Uh, what are people asking for? There's lots of great permissioned uh, options like Sovereign, right? There's um, people covering certain bases on other systems. We thought Bitcoin needed a really, you know, awesome option. So that's why we did that. I think it's use case driven. Like if you're going to try and, you know, <sighs> I decentralized identity, right, is one of those things where if you're talking about robust, large scale systems of decentralized identity and you're looking at like what are these the biggest blockchains out there that are, you know, robustly decentralized, um, it kind of makes sense for Bitcoin. So there wasn't a lot of pushback. It's, you know, it just kind of makes sense for our use case. I don't know that that's the case for other sorts of use cases. So maybe that's why people get pushback internally. Um, but it, it seemed to make logical sense, you know. Well, what is the first use case you would like to see or that you think you will be seeing eventually in using this network? Oh, in DIDs? I mean, you know, there's like the, the underlying stuff or the, the core stuff. I call it core identity, 
right? Because identity in our concept is everything you see, do, you know, all your digital footprint. That can include like your app data, your texts, your photos, like all of that should be, be yours, right? You, you should have dominion over those things. Um, but core identity is like your driver's license or your, you know, these proofs that you vend to people. I think that'll probably be the first use case because it's the one that in every identity person's mind, even in traditional identity, that's what they see as identity. So I think that'll be a, a cool one where people can have more seamless digital interactions for proving things. I think we'll transition over years into potentially app data and other interesting constructs that are still very much part of your identity. Uh, but I think the claims stuff is probably what's gonna happen first. Beautiful. I really look forward to see much more of this stuff. Any final thoughts you would like to share, Daniel? Um, no, I mean, really, it's just, you know, I'll go back to, to this, uh, this slide here, which is, I think, the most important one out of all of these, which is get involved. Um, whether it's for elements, which you'll hear about in a couple of weeks, I think, or, or shortly from SSM Meetup uh, on Ethereum, or it's Cytree, or it's Ion, um, or other things like, you know, Sovereign, or all these other um, communities. Get involved, uh, help the general ecosystem of decentralized identity. That's what our goal should be. Uh, I don't think anyone wins identity. Ion isn't meant to be something like that. It's meant to be an option and a tool that people can use. Um, so dig in and love decentralized identity and help us make that a reality in general. Beautiful. Couldn't have said it better. Um, I would love to have you in the future, maybe in a couple of months if you have time, also to talk about um, diff. And because um, that would be really interesting to, to, to get an overview so that everyone can learn what this is about. Um, as Daniel mentioned before, we will be having next week, the 20th of June, same time, um, Elements, um, which is um, the, the, the same, ver um, same as Iron running on the Ethereum network. So that will be really interesting to see that too. And we're really lucky to have had Daniel today to talk about Iron. So next week we have Elements. Um, please um, join our Telegram channel, Twitter, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, and all those things if you want to keep on being updated on all the things coming up. Um, Daniel, thank you so much. This was very, very interesting. And I hope we can also talk again in future ones things keep on, have matured more and, and to keep on learning more about how, how Iron is doing and how Iron is growing. Great, thank you so much. Thank you.